Hey, it's Jeff Gora. This week on Artist Wave Sunday Surf, my interview guest is actress Juliana Falk. We're going to be talking all about what's going on with the writer's strike, how it's impacting the industry, and what you can do about it. Check it out. Hi, Juliana. Hi, Jeff. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Let me just hide myself here. <laughs> I always hate staring at that box. There we go. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I guess I, uh, I hope I can lend some kind of uh, voice for the actor. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's great to meet you. And, and I appreciate your being open to talking about a subject that is both informative and important. Let's, I guess that's a good way to put it. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> So I always like to start and ask, like, just how are you? How is the current environment for you? What's going on in your world? How are you doing? Um, overall, I will say surprisingly good. Um, I know that I will say good with the asterisk. It's been a roller coaster because I feel like at the beginning of the strike, we've all we all kind of we were bracing for it. We were prepared for it. We voted for it. Everybody sort of knew it was coming, especially with the, the WGA strike happening. And so we were ready. And so I feel that that was helpful just to kind of brace ourselves, say, okay, this is going to be a bumpy ride. It might be a long one, but also this is what we have to do. So I was ready for it. I'll speak for some of my other friends and actors. I knew they were ready for it. Does it make it easier, like day to day, of finding ways to stay busy and productive and and you know, proactive in my own craft, in my own way, and finding ways to still have a creative outlet. And there are still some auditions happening. So that's actually nice. So overall, I'm good. But if you ask me tomorrow, that might change. <laughs> Fair enough. Same, same here, too. It depends upon uh, the time of day or the day. And, you know, some, I think that's that's fair for everybody. Um, so let's take a quick step back. You're in you're in L.A., correct? Yeah. You're yeah. You're situated in LA. You're from the LA area, right? Outside and, of LA, Inland Empire, but yeah, from here. Okay. So what brought you into wanting to be into this space? And when did you know that this type of career was calling your name? Oh, goodness. I would say as early as I knew it was a potential for a career, which was probably age six or seven. My uncle is an actor. Uh, so I grew up visiting him on set in Malibu. They did a lot of shooting at the beach. Um, he was on a show back in the 80s called Alien Nation. And so we would go out and visit him on set. And my dad and mom would take me out there. And I just was so enamored with the cameras and the set life and watching them do takes. And I didn't realize it was a, a career. It was a job option until a little bit after that. Um, but then I started to create characters of my own. I would imitate the likes of, you know, oh goodness, Robin Williams, or I was doing Ace Ventura imitations as a kid and, and was really inspired by the goofy character actors. So as a kid, I always leaned into that. And I loved the idea of having to kind of create a world outside of myself. And, and it was fun. I got to play different people. So I would say as early as that. And then what brought me to LA, I moved out here in 2008, the last time there was a strike, uh, and was just stars in my eyes, ready to just hit the ground running without having really any clue of how to do it. And so I came out here, I lived in Studio City for a while and quickly got a new, just a new slash. It's not you don't just move out there and get discovered like Pam Anderson. You have to work really, really hard. And at the time, I didn't understand what was going on with the strikes and how that affected Hollywood and how it affected the actors and the whole industry and the whole city, really. Uh, so two years after that, I moved away and was like, I'm done acting. This is not for me, um, even though it was my, what I wanted to do my whole life. And then eventually found my way back to it uh, in the Bay Area, actually. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. I love when that happens. Every time I, I feel like I'm going to like, all right, I, I've had enough. I've given it all I can. And like, I, and there's something weird that you don't expect that hooks you back in that I'm like, oh, maybe I will be, all right, maybe I'll do it this way. Maybe I'll go out in the field and do live interviews. Maybe I'll write from a different voice and you just can't let it go. But, but I love that. And I can totally see why 
growing up in Malibu, uh, going to acting sets in a place like Malibu, Malibu can be pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah. And it definitely, when I came back to it in the Bay Area in like 2015, um, so there was a big kind of gap there where I leaned into other parts of my creative side. I was writing and doing music, but it, there was no pressure. I took the pressure off of myself to make it or to to really, I had all these stipulations as a kid. I want to be this by this age. And I, I want to have all these accolades by this. And really that's unrealistic if you go into it with that mindset. So when I came back to acting as just a creative outlet in, in the Bay area, it was really just, yeah, let's just see what this, this market's about. And so there was no pressure. And when I, when I did that stuff just started to happen, I got an agent, I started to audition. I was doing short films and indies and I was booking like crazy because I didn't have a lot of expectations so I did find that was a really really nice way to kind of enter back into the world just because it's a smaller market I got to know other actors I got to know the casting directors and I felt like I could come into it um, in a different way and build that confidence in a smaller market so I definitely recommend that too for anybody who's trying to get in but they're not quite sure everybody automatically moves to LA or New York and I think especially now there's so many opportunities outside of those big cities that you can really get a footing and, and make a name for yourself. So that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's a good perspective. I never really thought about it like that, but I guess in a way that's kind of what I did. I lived in New York for a long time, but I didn't start in this space and really find my niche until I was in Boston, which you wouldn't necessarily peg for an entertainment town. Although the music's not bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> what about in commercials? What's the commercial life right now? Like, is that kind of a halted as well? So it, I'm SAG, I'm union. So yeah. it's hard to say because union commercials for a while have been, I don't want to say a thing of the past, but a lot, predominantly all commercials, I won't say all, but a predominant amount of commercials are non-union. So if you join the union, you have to understand that you're getting, you're getting a, a big benefit by joining the union. The jobs you're going to have the opportunities to audition for and book are going to be next level, and the talent that you're working with is next level, um, but you're going to have fewer opportunities. And so I kind of understood that when I when I joined and I knew that the commercial auditions were definitely going to slow down and they did. Um, but knowing that when I get the opportunity for a sad commercial, I know it's going to be, you know, a great contract, a great spot, uh, the potential to make you know, decent amount of money, not as much as you used to make on commercials, but it's it's a good game. Now, I will say with that said, I have friends that are FICOR and that work a lot and that audition a lot. I have friends that are non-union and or SAG eligible and haven't joined and are still auditioning quite a bit. Um, but for me personally, the commercial space has definitely slowed down. Um, it's, a, it's like a love-hate relationship with commercials too. I, I love doing it because I'd rather be doing that type of work and acting than slinging coffee like I used to. But there's a lot more free time. <laughs> Gotcha. Thank you for uh, for sharing. That's um that's interesting because like often when you think about what's going on here, you think about okay, the right it's it's often framed as writer strike, and then common sense, you know that that involves the actors, the actresses. But do you? I'm not sure everyone that has common knowledge of the situation is thinking about well, what about like production people, and what about like behind the scenes of all the other careers that participate in the, in this type of work. You don't necessarily think about that. I know someone who is very hopeful, but is thinking about like, I might have to move. Like I might have to, mm -hmm. I'm getting to the point where, and that's a little extreme, but nonetheless, there's a, there is a greater community affected by this type of work. But at the same time, it's a really unique ba balance, I guess is the word. It's a unique situation because you're like rage against the machine. Like yeah, you use your voice here. You do what's right. Let's make this happen. So, yeah, I feel like for production and for kind of everybody else involved. I mean, the reality is we all collaborate and we're working together to not only fight for better contracts and working wages, but to come out of this together and to and to stick together. And I think the the hard part right now is that the mainstream media and the trades, as much as it's where we go to for our information, a lot of it's skewed. So even as an actor who I get up, I go, I'll read the trades. I've 
few and far these days, just because I now I'm going to SAG emails, um, SAG Instagram for updates, the WGA Instagram and, and emails. So I'm just trying to keep up with what is coming from our organizations rather than going to the trades, which are mostly owned by the studios. So I'm trying to just stick to the facts as they come in from the people negotiating on my behalf. With that said, everybody that's involved, I think for the most part, everybody I've spoken to in on the one, you know, in front of the camera or behind the camera, they're all on the same page. There are those few that are kind of like, hey, look, let's just get this done. But when you look at the reality of it, I have a really good friend who works in post-production in the VFX space. And he's still working because they're not a part of a union. They're one of the only departments um, outside of, you know, IATSE and production that are not the VFX space. His department is not unionized. So he's still working. They're still um, pushing along, but they've been having internal talks about like, you guys, this, what are we doing here? Do we unionize? Do we move forward? They're all fighting for also streaming rights and residuals. They don't obviously get them. And that's the hard part is that trying to decide okay do we because i know marvel's going through some conversations like this in the post-production space so it's like do we go against and say we you know we're fighting for for better wages and pay us more and and better working conditions and be out of the job or do we stick to working because we're kind of the only people working right now and feed our families so it's kind of this double-edged sword of they don't really want to stop working because they are the only parts of production in, in big studio films and, and shows that are working but they also want to put their foot down as well I think everybody wants to come out of this with a better deal and and wants to do that sooner than later the other side of it is that if you look at the facts and you look at the financials is like what we're asking for WJ and SAG together even if they we included IATSE I'm sure it wouldn't make much of a difference but it's less than 2% of their bottom line. Like, and so when you look at it that way and you're saying to Disney or to Marvel or wherever, and you're like, hey, this isn't at the end of the day, it's not gonna do anything to you guys. It's not gonna break your bank, but I think there's a little bit of this like stubborn push and pull. So I think they're trying to hold out as long as they can. I haven't had any friends say they're gonna move yet, which thankfully I think everybody for the most part actors have been working side hustles and side jobs for so long that this not working not auditioning is hard but not working is not really as sad to say but it's not news to us um as, as far as my circle of friends I have friends that were and are series regulars on shows and they're, they're out there on the picket lines they're like no we agree I have friends that are on Amazon shows and are like we we want a better contract because even though they're on a you know, series regular on an Amazon show, they're not making a lot of money. So it's kind of hard to be like, well, let's just end this and go back to work when everybody, if we do that, knows that we're, we're not getting ahead in this, in this fight. So I think everybody is on the same page, but to your point about the production side of it, it's like, there are still small projects. There's still legitimate independent film and, and, pilots even being made and there is work it's out there you have to kind of go digging for it and really use your network of people and connect but it is out there and I you know and again this will end but it's just that I I am encouraging friends too that are reading the trades like well I saw this and I'm like don't let it fool you like like let's like talk to your other fellow creatives and see what's really going on see what projects are available because there's a lot of work out there. I think that we can all pull together and, and make just even independent stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That is, um, that, that's been really cool to see actually to some of these like creative endeavors that have come out of it and people like trying different things. Do you feel like there's been progress? Like, do you, do you feel hopeful after how the past couple of weeks and months have gone? I do. I do feel hopeful because I think, we have a really, I'll speak for SAG because I'm not a part of the WGA, even though I do write. Um, Fran Drescher is a pit bull in the best possible way. And I think that she's the perfect woman to lead this fight right now. And she has a great support system and everybody on the negotiating committee. And I, I do have a friend, a part of that as well. And I think that everybody is to the point where they understand that we are 
I don't want to say the whole part, but we are the creatives that create what you watch. We are the people that bring it together and collectively as a whole, like we want to work together. We love collaborating and we love working with our fellow actors, writers, producers, set dressers. Like it's just, it's such a community that if we don't band together now during the fight of it all, like what's the point? Cause this, this whole medium is a collaboration. So I, I am hopeful that we're all staying strong and really fighting for what's right. We know that we're fighting for what's right. We're not being greedy. We're not being malicious. We're saying, hey, we're inflation is happening. We're all, everything is rising. Prices of everything, right? So we all deserve a status. I hate saying this, like a piece of the pie, but it's like, we do, we deserve to be compensated for our work and not just be paid a flat fee and told to move on. And that's all you're going to get, but they're going to go off and make lots of money from, from these products. So I am hopeful that we'll keep fighting for that. I think that we're getting to that point, especially the WGA being a hundred plus days in already. And once, and they're, you know, they're back to the table, there's stuff, there's conversations happening. Um, so I do think that we're getting close. Um, but I did just read an article saying that, you know, they had a conversation and it wasn't, it, although they were led to believe they were coming back to the table to actually negotiate what's on the contracts and what we're fighting for. It was more or less um, another kind of bait and switch back to the table and we're not going to give you what you want. Then why are we here? Because they know, like they should know at this point, like we're not, we're not backing down. And I don't think we should because at this point too, everybody's realizing, Oh, we can go back to reality TV for a while and, and competition shows. But I think audience members that aren't even involved in the industry on a creative side, they're going to start to get really sick of that. And they're going to realize like, Oh, I really miss all those great, amazing shows that were out during COVID and, and the things that everybody turned on when they were at home and, and needed something to just escape. I think they're going to realize. So I'm hoping that's the one thing I'm hoping is that we start to garner a little more support from, from the people outside the creative community. And I think we have it. It's just a matter of, you know, what, what headlines are you reading is really what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. You know, we're, we're a voice platform ultimately. And what I mean yeah. by that is, is we're, we're a proponent and a champion of voice in the creative space and however you can, however that is interpreted. And I think like what you guys are doing and what the examples you're giving are voice coming to life. So I, I think it's very admirable and inspiring. Um, and I see that I see how the coming together behind this common mission is, is already having an impact probably more than sometimes is publicly broadcasted. Um, mm -hmm. But I am curious for those that are not necessarily in tune with it or in that space of like, well, I'm not going to do anything because I don't know what to do. I'll just, mm -hmm. no, I'll just wait and oh, this is annoying. Like what can, what can people do that they don't really know about to help? I'm glad you asked. Um, so yeah. there's, there is, I'm not going to say there's a ton of stuff you can do because at the end of the day, even as an actor, part of this union, there's only so much I can do. I will say, obviously, the first thing that everybody goes to is a monetary contribution. So if you have the means and that's all you can do, there any type of donation, big or small, is helpful for the people, like you're saying, that are threatened by having to move out of town or threatened to have to go get a you know, a day job, if you want to say that, like the writers who were in a writer's room before this happened and now are left out unemployed right now. Um, there are, you know, through the WGA and the SAG After Foundation, there are um, funds available that these people can turn to and say, hey, I'm, I'm struggling. I need some, some assistance. So obviously donating to one of those organizations would be great. Aside from that, if you live in the LA area or even other areas, you know, New York is having strikes. San Francisco is having people show up look at your local communities, uh, either SAG-AFTRA organization, and you can go out and pick it. You don't have to be union. You can show up, give you a shirt and a pin and a sign and go meet people and talk to other people and, and ask what's really going on. And just be a body on the street and a voice there is really, really helpful. Uh, because as you know, as strikes go on, the longer they go on, people start to kind of teeter out. And then we get some, some new fresh energy out there and it really does help. Um, reposting stuff on social media. So if you see something from the SAG Instagram or the WJ Instagram or people that are out on the picket lines, um, photos, 
videos, news articles, reposting those and just spreading it to your audience because especially people who aren't in the creative community, a lot of my followers or the people I follow are within this, this bubble. And there are the few that are outside of it, of course, but just kind of broadcasting saying, Hey, I support this. Maybe you could look into it as well. And then when it comes down to like shows and TV, we're not at the point yet where we're saying, Hey, maybe boycott watching this network or this, this streaming service. We're not there yet. And also because it does support the actors and the creatives that put their heart and soul into those projects. So I don't think we're there. I hope it doesn't get to that, but you know, if your Netflix can't, you know, if your subscription is up for renewal, maybe you just don't renew for a month or so. (laughs) Like, I mean, there are ways we can use our voice without, without doing that, I think, um, but just spreading the word and, and supporting the local people. If you have a friend who is an actor or, or writer, reach out and just like you said, ask how they're doing. Um, yeah. Maybe offer to buy them a cup of coffee and, and talk about industry or non-industry related stuff, because it is nice to kind of have some something outside of this to look forward to. So maybe that's a cup of coffee with a friend and you don't have to pay for it. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah that's awesome that's always something you can do it always helps and 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 like like you said just sometimes taking yourself away from it is is help or taking the other person away from it is something you can do that that mm-hmm. brings you back to a fresh perspective so i really appreciate your thoughtfulness and uh, all the insight you're providing on on a important subject matter so we always i always kind of ride out on a fun uh, topic that brings this full circle, given the name, given the logo and all of the other uh, silly reasons behind it. But I am curious, every, I ask everybody what was their favorite concert they've ever been to and what is the next one you're going to? Okay, so I don't know. Favorite concert, I I have two because okay. my first, I grew up going to concerts. My dad's a musician and I grew up uh my first job was like working catering for concerts. So I was side stage at concerts all the time. So I will say my most memorable one though, was the Spice Girls tour. I want to say 2000 and like, oh goodness. Or maybe it was in the 90s, 98. It was, I had a Spice Girls Polaroid pink camera and I got to go to the show and was very close. So it was a Spice World tour. So that was my most memorable. Love the Spice Girls. Um, Right on. And then the next one, I know. Um, I also went to a really, really amazing um, concert in San Francisco. I saw the XX play with some friends and that was just a oh. different, a whole different experience, which is amazing. I like, I like like an intimate show. Um, and then the next one, oh my goodness. I don't have any on the books, but I have been craving a show for a long time. I know everybody just in their mother and cousin and brother saw Taylor Swift and it was everywhere. And that I think would have been a fun show. I'm not a huge Swifty. I like the songs, but I don't know. I really, really do want to go to a show at the Hollywood Bowl. I've never been. And so that's my, my next show. I'm going to aim to go there regardless of who it is. (laughs) I've never been either. And it's also a place I'm dying to go to. So I think if there's anything we take back from like one of the main, not that's not one of the things we take back here is we make that happen. Uh, when, yes. when you know it has to happen one way or the other next time uh it's available um yes. <laughs> uh so i'm also i'm also a huge surfer and i bring that up which because it's also part of the platform and i find from a creative perspective there's nothing that i create as well as i do after i come from some type of time on a beach on an ocean on a wave getting my getting rocked off a wave and getting back up again do you, are you a surfer? And also we talked a little bit about it beforehand, but are you inspired creatively by your time in that atmosphere? Absolutely. And that is why when I moved back to LA with my family, we chose Santa Monica because I absolutely love the ocean. I am partially terrified to be in it, but I love going in. And I I used to surf as a fearless high schooler. And then as I've gotten older, I've gotten more and more clumsy and more afraid of sharks for some reason, but it's one of my goals. I like bought the long sleeved bathing suit to like, just even give myself a different perspective. Like, Oh, I, I won't be as cold if I have this bathing suit. So yes, I 
plan to get back out there on a board. I'm actually going to Hawaii next month. So I'm planning to surf there. The ocean is some a place that more than any place in the world, probably water in general is where I was, where I probably gain a lot of inspiration. And we just got back from a, a trip up North. We were camping at the, like outside Bodega Bay. And I spent a lot of time running up on the ocean and did a couple of dives in little polar plunge and came out of it and ended up going back to our campsite and just writing for hours. And I think that that's something that I've always done is I'll go down even just to look at the ocean, meditate, write, journal, whatever it is. Uh, So yeah, long winded, but yes, the ocean is probably where I find the most peace and solace and, and inspiration. Awesome. Any particular project or creative Pete or writing that you've done that came from that space that you would, that you would shout out? Yeah, actually I started writing a film called that loosely titled Paella and it's based um, on some experiences of mine, but set in Hawaii and Maui. And I left Maui two years ago, went with um, my family and, we were walking through the the jungle outside of Paella and with friends ended up jumping in this waterfall and waterbed. I was fully clothed, but I was like, whatever, jumped in and had the most amazing time. And I left that and I got, I usually don't start writing until I have a vision of an opening scene or something in the film. And I had some pretty vivid visions of the setting, the characters, the car that my protagonist was going to drive, the wardrobe she was going to wear, the the music, like it was a sublime song, bumping in like an old VW convertible bug. And I was like, okay, like I see it. And it's funny because that happens. And then I'm like, now what's the story? <laughs> here's my character. Here's my protagonist. Here's my setting. What am I What am I saying? And so I actually did come up with that idea. And I've been writing it on and off for a couple of years. So yeah, that one, loosely titled Paella. Very cool. Love it. <laughs> I like the title too. I, I uh, hope to see it soon somewhere. Thanks. Um, Well, thank you so much for your time and for being open to doing this. And I'm really looking forward to sharing your messages and and what people can do to participate and to uh, also be proponents for voice. Um, It's very inspiring. And I appreciate really all that you uh, were willing to talk about. That was really, really, really fun and great to chat with you. Thank you for having me, Jeff. And if if anybody is looking for a place to go picket, I spend a lot of time in Culver City at the Amazon uh, studio picket line because it's cooler there's parking there's bathrooms and we're a fun bunch so come on out support the strikes if you're able to